All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm uh, James Horvath, and your 2021 president for AI Las Vegas chapter. I'm excited to welcome everyone here tonight as we have a great presentation for you. Uh, this month, we've been putting together with our COAT committee, which is Committee on the Environment for AI Las Vegas. Before I get to introductions of the committee chair, I'd like to first say a few thank yous to our evening sponsors. Tonight is brought to our members through the sponsorship of our visionaries. Those are NIT Studios, Nevada Sales Agency, the Pensa Building Group, and Clyde Juba Wald, as well as our platinum sponsors, who is Harris Consulting Engineers, TJK Consulting Engineers, Bergman Walls and Associates, and Grand Canyon Development Partners. Coates' purpose is to engage and educate AIA members to the importance of sustainability, renewable resources, climate change, and environmental issues. The committee is chaired by Rick Van Diepen, who I'd like to introduce and turn the presentation over to. Rick? Thanks very much, James. I'm extremely proud to be introducing our speakers this evening, and I'm excited to be representing the AIA Committee on the Environment, which has helped to bring you this program during Earth Week. With the historic conviction of Derek Chauvin this week, it really hit home for me how important it is for citizens to speak up and to work together to demand justice. Architects and other design professionals are recognizing the role they play in advocating, educating, and ultimately designing buildings and neighborhoods that promote social and environmental justice. The effects of climate change are becoming more clear every year and more and more citizen architects are standing up and taking on the mantle of leadership that is required to move the building industry towards zero emissions by 2030. The effects of climate change are first felt uh, and most severely felt by low income citizens and people of color because poorer neighborhoods are most often the least resilient to the effects of severe heat and drought. Those neighborhoods have the highest temperatures, have lower access to public transit, job centers, and grocery stores. Affordable housing is rarely built in central neighborhoods where these community services exist, which is why it is important for architects and city planners to be involved in the development of thoughtful, affordable housing. I've been a huge fan of Environmental Works out of Seattle for many years. Uh, they're a nonprofit organization, actually, uh, that is dedicated, a, a nonprofit design firm um, that is community based and they're com completely committed to developing sustainable, affordable housing. Um, our esteemed speakers tonight, and thank you again both for joining us, are Melissa Scoach. She uh, entered architecture because of her belief that everyone deserves shelter and a place to call home. She was drawn to environmental works by its mission and ideals. She is committed to community design as a tool that enriches cities and spaces through empowering communities to design to their needs and wants. During her architectural studies, she learned hands-on skills in construction and was inspired by architecture's capacity to empower people and change their lives for the better. New to Seattle, Melissa is excited to learn and absorb as much about the city and people as she can. In her spare time, she enjoys, enjoys being outside in nature and spending time on the water. Uh, Melissa has a master's, um, and a master's from the University of Kansas in architecture and a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from the University of Kentucky. Thank you again for joining us, Melissa. Thanks for having um, me. All right, great. Our other speaker, Bill Singer, is the Director of Architecture and he's the Housing Lead and he's also a Lead AP at Environmental Works. Um, Bill holds a core value that housing is a right, not, not just a privilege. He's committed to bringing high quality design and dignified housing to people of all income levels. Leading Environmental Works Affordable Housing Studio, Bill has worked in uh, architecture for more than 34 years with 23 at Environmental Works on a variety of community oriented gathering spaces and sustainable affordable housing projects. His commitment to honoring the dignity of all people regardless of income results in high quality design that reflects the mission and values of our nonprofit and public clients throughout the Puget Sound. Thank you again, and I'll hand it over to you for your presentation. Great, thank you again for, for having us both. Um, so we, we work for Environmental Works, and um, as Rick mentioned, uh, we are an architecture firm 
and we also have a landscape team, but we are addressing the needs of underserved communities with socially and environmentally sustainable design. Um, who we are, a nonprofit community design center empowering Washington's most vulnerable people and communities to create the spaces that need to succeed. Um, we're a 5013 C3 nonprofit um, partnering with other nonprofit organizations, municipality agencies, other underrepresented communities. Um, and others that aren't served by the architecture profession. Those are the, the clients that we serve. Um, we provide architecture, landscape and planning services. Um, we are considered a public interest architecture that fully embodies design, placemaking and community-based design. How we came to be, uh, we started environmental works about 51 years ago on April 22nd, 1970 on Earth Day. And it started out as a grassroots um, where it was a bunch of uh, groups of students from the University of Washington that were called to action during the keynote speaker in 1978. Um, and this is a, was a quote from that national convention that sprung them to action. And it reads, we are not at a loss in our society for the know-how. We have the technology, we have the scientific know-how, we have the resources. We are at a loss for the will. You are not a profession that has distinguished itself by your social and civic contributions to the cause of civil civil rights. And I'm sure this does not come to you as any shock. You are most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete irreverence. So this quote um, really activated and called to arms the, um, the design services and the need for architecture services um to to speak louder and to get involved and this is another quote um that is similar and it says i have read about architects who have courage who had a social sensitivity and i can't help but wonder about an architect that builds some of the public housing we see in the cities of this country Some of the things that we do, actually, um, are to um, provide collaborative design solutions. Um, we are an architecture firm with all of the services um, for our, that are architectural. Landscape architecture, accessible, respectful, respectful planning, design services, feasibility, pre-development services, proposals and budgeting for clients that um, need more, more guidance. And at the very beginning, we also helped with some grant writing. Um, after this spearhead idea of, um, from that quote, EW um, moved into the old fire station that the city wasn't using and was going to be turned into a parking lot and is still there today. Um, we help nonprofits and community groups make sure their proposals fit into zoning laws and realistic budgets. Um, some of the first projects that we worked on were um, getting and working with community groups to design and build school playgrounds, free medical clinics, teaching elementary students about urban environmental issues, 
Uh, we even ran workshops in Fremont where volunteers would come to borrow tools and get help on any other um, number of community projects around the area. There is even um, a Fremont sculpture that I was spearheaded in the wee hours of the night where um, there wasn't enough funds or to get it engineered properly, um, but the community came together and uh, built uh, this aluminum um, cast sculpture to bring the community and neighborhood together. Some of the, the studios that we have in our office, we have four. Um, one of them is housing where we work on multi-family, tribal, permanent supportive housing, low income and workforce housing. Um, we have a, a landscape architecture studio that works on trail systems, public art and heritage, master planning, lighting, sensory gardens, the community facility studio works on childcare, early learning, senior centers, community centers, tenant improvement, and food banks. But we also have special projects of historic rehabilitation, group homes for people living with disability. As an office, we do our work and we do this work um, because we care about place making uh, and the community at large. Um, and as an office, we hold design charrettes, we do check ins, uh, lessons learned, and have clients and people come in and present what their organization is about and how end users are using the space. We do this to empower end users, create cultural responsive spaces, strengthen relationships and build bridges. We truly believe that everyone deserves good design because we all benefit from it. And this is just a uh, a description of community design centers and, and what they're dedicated to do, um, such as provide planning, design, and development services to low and moderate income communities, utilizing strong community engagement processes. Some of the design processes that we implement are um, these uh, design charrettes and neighborhood um, vision meetings and how we go about that is we um, use the pomegranate method which is a way to gather the community's input and ideas we we pose a question um, well we first get together with if there's a steering committee and um, if the steering committee has goals and desires of how um, a community, uh, what is needed in the community, we have these design charrettes and we come together with these, I, this proposed question to bring to the community of what they want their space to look like. Um, and how we do that is we um, provide either a kit of parts um, where it's very interactive, where we have a plan or a site, a site plan that engages members to either put dots on spaces that they feel are really um, what they're looking for, the image of what they're looking for, um, as, as well as they can cut up pieces of paper um, and then also implement and say what kind of um, spaces they want to make, if, whether they want to have a community garden, um, what's really important to them if 
if security is really important in the neighborhood or if they want you know a barbecue or something like that um, they are able to get their ideas out and then we um, separate into smaller groups that um, by separating it into smaller groups, they're able to come together with a common theme. And this is just a, a design process mapping of how we go about getting community input. And like I said before, there's, there's usually a vision that we're approached um, that expresses the design intent and mission of, of the program or building that they want to implement. We devise up a team, set goals, schedule, um, outreach. We get the context analysis. And then we, we go around and, and get inspiration, whether it's influence or precedence around the neighborhood um, or exactly what culture um inputs that that we have in the site context um as well as reaching out to the community and then we we come up with concepts schemes and then we continue to go back out into the community to get their input um, some of the different ways that we can get the data is face-to-face -face communication group community meetings online or paper surveys. And with COVID being um, a little bit of a challenge, we are starting to do um, things online and um, engaging with people through um, Miro and, and different products that are different programs uh, to get people to engage in and, and do the kind of kit of parts online. Um, then we, we dive into the materials of, of the context of the area, whether it's wood construction or concrete or, or what is readily available in that local area. Uh, this is just a couple of images of how the design process goes of um, getting community engagement. Um, again, we, we truly believe that people should have a say in what is built in their, in their neighborhoods. And so this kind of represents space planning and, and discussing different ideas and, and how we um, gather that information and then just distribute it out. Um, so today we're going to be talking about three different projects and three different case studies. The first one will be the the tiny house village and we'll discuss um, how the built process goes and that is a supportive housing shelter. Um, the next would be place of hidden waters which is tribal housing and that will dive into the design process um, that was implemented and then lastly we'll talk about Claire's place that is supportive housing um, and how we used funding as well as sustainability, sustainable aspects um, for in that project. So this is uh, the tiny house village that is distributed um, all throughout Washington. And this is 100 square feet and um, we got approached by, and developed a handbook with um, sorry, I don't know if you can see this. Oops. 
um, with technologies, the Technology Center and the Low Income Housing Institute, Lehigh. Uh, we were approached by them and worked with them to create this manual handbook on how to build a tiny house. And so what you could do is you can, you can find this handbook on our website and go to Lowe's and hand them this, this pamphlet and they will be able to supply all of the supplies is, that are needed to build this building. So anybody could do this within their backyard or their garage. Um, they, could, they could build this building as a kit of parts and get it um, transferred to the site that these tiny homes are gonna be on. And so what we um, provide is site planning services and permitting for um, the tiny house projects. The majority of these buildings are built off site and transported to the sites. They're, they're usually formed in these different kind of neighborhoods to where they all are centered around this common area um, where they can con congregate. Um, there's also usually a kitchen, a common kitchen, a restroom, storage area, as well as a food pantry. Again, this is a great opportunity for the neighborhood and community to really um, and capture and to come around um, the people that are um, going through homelessness. And so it really is an inviting opportunity for people to come and paint and to um, really come and lend a, hand, a handing, lending a handy hand um, to help build these structures. And these are just some of the sponsors that um, have aided in this effort. Um, and it continues to be, um, be done throughout, or currently it's, it's still being done. Um, because there's, there's always a growing need um, for housing here. Um, well, let's, if I can just uh, fill in on this, one of the, I don't yeah. know if uh, in Las Vegas, you have the same problem in Seattle and throughout the Puget Sound, we've had a huge issue with people living in tents and on the streets. So the tiny house movement in Seattle was the, literally the first step in getting people off the streets, out of their cars, out of tents. This is not, I just want to be clear, this is not considered a permanent solution to housing. This was an emergency effort. These units are, are not plumbed. They do have electricity. So they do provide a safe, secure, locked space that have heat. But um, it's a Band-Aid to the emergency of homelessness that we're incurring in the Northwest. Um, there's a huge movement right now in Seattle to expand this because we have currently uh, almost 13,000 people living unhoused in uh, the King County, Seattle area. So the tiny house movement uh, has been this kind of emergency band-aid approach to get people off the streets. But I just want to make it clear, we don't consider this permanent housing. Uh, it's not how we would want anybody to have to live, but it's a huge improvement over living on the street, you know, on the sidewalk. Just wanted to put that caveat out there. Yeah, yeah. that's great, thank you. Um, and then we, in this project, we are lead as well as seed which is a social economic environmental design that provides a common standard to guide 
evaluate and measure the social, economic, environmental impact of design projects. Um, SEED's mission is to advance the right of every person to live in a socially, economically, and environmentally healthy community. Some of SEED's print guiding principles are to advocate for those who have limited voice in public life, build structures for inclusion that engage stakeholders and allow communities to make decisions, promote social equality through discourse that reflects a range of values and social identities, generate ideas that grow from place and build local capacities designed to help conserve resources and minimize waste. The, the next case study that we will be talking about is uh, Place of Hidden Waters, which is a tribal housing um, that's located in Tacoma, Washington. This is a quote from um, Annette Bryan, which is an executive director of the Puyallup Nation Housing Authority. This project is not only protecting Mother Earth, it is transforming lives. The design encourages community interaction. Our tenants are gardening, cooking, learning, praying, and living in concert together like we have done for generations. This project has three phases. Um, they started off with an existing gym, uh, tore down an old group room and renovated um, and recladded townhomes, updated the MEP systems and did the entry porches, as well as added 20 new townhomes. Um, in phase one, they, the focus was on geothermal heating wells and it reached lead platinum by doing that. In phase two for the townhomes, um, the investment was to do uh, solar panels on the roofs. And by doing that, uh, the project was net zero in energy. So it was, it was a wash um, and proved to be really uh, a, a well energy efficient um, aspect to do is to use um, solar panels. There were also triple glazed windows, structurally insulated panels on the walls and roof. And uh, there was fluid applied, there is a fluid applied air barrier as well. This project went through extensive community design process with workshops uh, with the tribes. The goal of doing this building or having this building was to rebuild the community. Um, the project expresses and responds to the traditions on how previous generations lived and building and how they built from generations. Um, the resident community workshops, the benefit was to make a house a home, to provide a sense of ownership and empowerment, to present ideas that were transformative and tra provide transformation of the area and the community, Com companionship, it was also to provide network and support, security and safety, building support and trust with the larger community. Uh, the owner developer challenges their budget constraints as well as time constraints, fear of resident expectations being too high um, and conflicting needs of owner or residents.
this is one of the the kit of parts on how to lay out a unit and so we provided them a plan as well as um, these sticky uh, kits of, or parts where they can lay out their their residential space or their housing of how they want the kitchen to be as well as the living room and dining area and exactly what they how they want their space to flow this is representing some of the the traditional ways of building and um, this the Puel tribe um, was designing uh, shed style frame housing and receiving light from above and that as well as um, providing access to light and to nature and so by using that that um, was a way to respond to how the tribe has built for previous or in previous generations yeah, if I could just step in there too on the this the what we're showing here is the traditional Coast Salish longhouse on the right, and the way it was organized traditionally was the center space was communal space, and then the side spaces were kind of more private family spaces. So we kind of took that uh, longhouse idea and kind of re reorganized that in a modern way, but kept the same kind of communal uh, center space where all the apartments kind of focused in a gathering space in the middle and then the private residential uh, spaces were on the side. So uh, we kind of took the concept of the longhouse and gave it this modern interpretation, um, but kind of still integrated the same social connections of the traditional design. Thanks. Um, as a result of the community being engaged in, in the design process, um, there was this apprenticeship training program that was built in to this project where um, there was a skilled superintendent as well as other uh, unskilled workers that um, ended up building the, the townhomes um, as well as providing job training um, that they went on to, to join other con construction companies um, but this was an apprenticeship that um, tribal members were, were um, they benefited from, um, sorry, from uh, for getting this job training and this opportunity to, to really um, construct the homes as well as design the homes as well. Um, by doing this, this rejuvenated tribal pride. Um, so did you have anything to add to that portion? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the really gratifying things is the job training opportunities this gave to the tribal members. They, a number, I think there were 10 to a dozen tribal members who came to this without any construction experience. And after this was done, they were able to, you know, develop the job skills and now have jobs in construction industry. So that was a hugely gratifying part of this project, as well as kind of all the green features. And um, this project was awarded the 2012 Lead for Homes Project of the Year. So that was a huge honor that we, uh, were bestowed on that. And I think a lot of it, result of that was because of all the features, both the green features and the social sustainability that this project uh, showed and kind of 
these other aspects of not just the sustainability piece. Um, with the, these are just some of the images of the results of the, the community design process and how um, they wanted to have their, their kitchen and living room access to the outdoors um, and providing open spaces. Um, this was also like within the common ground area where there's um, a kitchen, a game room, and as well as um, a way to congregate around um, a fireplace. And one of the, on that, the interior, like uh, this tribe and then general in the Pacific Northwest cedar is kind of a sacred material. So we used it judiciously, but places where it really had an impact on uh, the residents. So this is kind of the main gathering place in the community room and it's kind of lined in cedar to really connect again, the, you know, the, the residents, the tribal members to their traditional roots. Um, and so this is, this was just a, an opening celebration of how um, this housing project was culturally and environmentally responsive. The next project that we're going to be discussing is Claire's Place, which is a supportive housing project in Everett, Washington. This project houses um, 25 or it's 25 units, 10 that are one bedroom. 65. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, 65 units and then 10 that are one bedroom. Yeah. Um, these house chronically homeless individuals that had been on chemically dependency, mental illness, and disabilities. Um, this was also a spearheaded um, priority by the city of Everett um, made to address homelessness. There um, is an initiative um, developed named Safe Streets Plan, and this was to get people off the streets. This was their understanding of um, seeing how taxpayer dollars were going to emergencies, hospital visits, jails, or jail visits, as well as police encounters. And this was a way to help people and take those resources um, and apply them into housing and supply services to keep people off the streets. And so this is um, providing housing first and then addressing the other issues following. Um, Everett also um, is a, the first city municipality that um, took a stance against the opiate crisis that was happening in Everett and ended up suing a major drug company for the effects that it had on their community. So this was a, a big um, priority for the city of Everett is to address the homelessness population that is there. Um, this is the site um, off of Evergreen Way up in Everett and it is right across the street um, from the fire department training facility as well as single family residential area. Um, and this is a main street within Everett this site was, was donated by the city um, to be used for this housing. Some funding resources that the project had were 
um, key community development corporation where we got tax credit equity, Washington State Housing Trust Fund, as well as the ultra high energy efficient efficiency. And this is a, a, a pilot program that um, this project received um, an extra $1 million to reach net zero. as well as Nahomish County and city of Everett, and then the city of Everett donated the lands. This project um, has the ground floor being um, a lot of co communal common spaces where there's a common kitchen, um, as well as a common living room space for multi-purpose. There's also a ground floor that is filled with case managers and offices um, to provide on-site services for the residents that are in need. This building was mainly um, designed for and shaped to provide um, optimal space for solar panels. There, the roof is sloped as well as provides an eight foot overhang. And there's over 650 PVs for this building. Here are just some examples of the unit kitchens as well as the ADA accessible shower. Um, we provided extra wide hallways and that was due to um, providing residents uh, a not tight, compact, confined area. And this was so they wouldn't feel constricted. Um, it, this also provided natural light, daylight at the end of all the hallways um, to help make the space look bigger. This is an example of an office meeting area. There is a ground floor kitchen and community space that that goes out into um, the open garden that's in the back. So they they also provided these gardening um, planters as well as a pet play area and smoking gazebos. Um, because it's a, a non-smoking smoking building. Um, and the residents here have really um, taken over the, the planting areas and have made them their own, um, giving people um, and residents a, a place of routine and a place to, to garden and um, grow herbs as well as um, vegetables that they can use. Some of the high performance features that are represented on this building is the triple glaze um, storefront windows and doors. Um, there's also rigid insulation that's on the exterior, continuous insulated slab, um, the roof in itself is R60 and it has a spray foam ceiling so, as well as um, fluid applied membrane. Um, and they're just all these different um, extra um, features for the building. A lot of the main energy sources are from um, the solar panels that are on the roof, everything is electric. Um, one of the key features in this building is that um, they use, we use the, the ultra um, high um, energy pilot program to have all these features. And one of them is whenever a resident opens a window or a door, it lowers or turns off the, the thermostat or the heating. So 
um, the residents can't blare up the heating um, and have a window open. And so that saves on energy costs. Um, as well as another one would be, is on the, um, the shower heating drains, there's uh, a copper coil that is wrapped around it and that um, does a heat exchange to recover all of the, the draining heat um, from the showers. And so that is able to be um, recovered and pulled back into the building. So it wouldn't be a waste of, of heat down the drain. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of um, energy is put into heating water. And so this was a big savings in the residential housing area and more than, than you would think instead of um, mechanically air heating, it's majority of the energy is from hot water. Um, and there's also benefits for having a very large overhang for the, the photovoltaics is because it also provides a sunshade. Um, during this, this process, we also had to do um, energy modeling and this just represents um, what that looks like and, and where the key um, design features should go. Some of the behavior modifications that we had to implement because if the residents here were just able to live how they want to live, um, we wouldn't reach the, the net zero mark. And so some behaviors that, that they had to change um, were to um, provide a, a common laundry, which adjusts number of loads based on, on benchmark laundry. And so there's this one centralized area for laundry and each unit did not have its own. Um, we discussed already the, the drain water heat recovery, which reduced hot water energy use by 15%. The window switches modeled infiltration was not increased to accommodate for opening windows. Um, there was master switching that reduced lighting and miscellaneous plugs. So whenever um, there, there was sun and, and light, the, the, the light like interior lighting dimmed. There is also a reduction of occupancy assumption from 1.6 to one person per apartment. Some lessons learned, learned that we implemented are um, that at the very beginning, it is good to have the MEP consultants and energy analysis as early as possible um, to go throughout the whole entire project. Um, there should be um, a general contractor and some subcontractors involvement during the design development um, to make sure that the scope and the goals are optimized. Um, as well as minimizing mod modulation of building form to reduce amounts of skin area where heat can be um, taken away from the building. Um, so the least skin area is the best. Um, did Bill, do you have any? Opinion? Yeah, one of the things, this um, thing about the 100 kilowatt uh, solar array, we ran into some challenges because it's a 220 kilowatt array. Our local utility actually considered us a small energy producer, which uh, they were, they were going to buy back our power at wholesale rates and then sell it to us at retail. So we weren't going to be getting 
the benefit, the full benefit of the solar production. So we had to work closely with the utility to kind of, again, this became a pilot project for the utility to give us the full benefit of the solar production. Cause this is a, they just did net metering, net metering. Our solar production just went back into the grid and then came back to us uh, buyback at energy. So um, that was a big issue of coordinating with our utilities to make sure we're getting the full benefit. And then we also have a very extensive digital control system on the project to actually monitor energy use. And we're now a year and a half in the occupancy and it's uh, they've been using the digital controls to be able to identify potential residents who are you know, using excessive amounts of uh, hot water or energy and they can spot those things fairly quickly and address them so you know, they aren't losing lots of dollars. Uh, um, you know, without, without being able to know what's going on. So the digital controls at a significant cost to the project, but uh, it's critical to include those if you're doing um, a high performance building and really wanna achieve that, uh, the net zero. Uh, we didn't, we haven't quite realized it in, you know, it's not, we aren't quite meeting what the model showed, but we're we're very close to what uh, you know the the utility costs for the owner are, are significantly down from what they would normally be um, on their on a regular project. So, um, so some ways that. Um... Environmental Works has provided uh, social change uh, is to be involved in co-development, uh, city be a part of a city planning board, um, continue to be in relationship with clients that have been along with us this whole time, um, networking with other community design centers, neighborhood associations, um, as well as Environmental Works was one of the founding members of Housing Development Consortium, which is a group of city organizations, housing authorities, contractors, developers, bankers, social or financial advisors, brokers. This is a, a whole group of of people that come together to talk about issues and provide advocacy for neighborhoods and communities throughout King County um, to meet the housing needs. And so even though we're, we're architects and landscape architects, there are ways to get involved in um, reform um, planning and, and be involved in, in co-development and what exactly is going on within our, our community at large and as well as neighborhood communities. Um, we talked about uh, numerous different sustainable aspects to our projects, but the main uh, sustainable things are that there's a need for durability. There's a need for exterior and, and heating systems that um, uh, provide a reduced maintenance and heating costs. Um, we create low cost buildings that don't look cheap. Um, there's also the use of using uh, durable products that are local, providing efficient space layouts, um, addressing or, or implementing low flow fixtures, operable windows, um, using photovoltaics to create more efficient design. And by doing all of these different things, um, more money can be spent to provide more housing instead of maintaining those buildings. Um, 
there's always a desire to to have community involvement and um, optimize limited resources that these projects have. So that, that is one side of sustainability and the other side of sustainability is, is more so people, people driven. Um, and by promoting, providing um, local economies, whether it's human, material or natural, um, it's, it's surrounding the community and um, empowering them to be a part of their built environment and putting the design in their, in their hands. Um, and this, that's by carefully adapting the building to honor a site's natural and cultural conditions and providing um, community ownership to where they're creating the spaces that they're using. And by doing that, they will take care of those spaces. Um, and these places um, are sustaining of the soul. They, they're spaces that are welcoming. Um, they can call home. They are needed and they provide a safe and functional space that could last generations um, and be a part of, of the family of the community. Um, so that there's the work is is not done yet, and um, as environmental works uh, sprung up from an idea, um, there's there's no one way of doing things. Um, but I think that the hope is that we can partner up with other community design centers nationwide that focus on social change. Um, to help provide opportunities to rural, suburban, city places to come together and learn from each other and grow in partnership and grow uh, with the wealth of knowledge that we all have. Um, and I just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've provided Environmental Works to speak with you all um, and hope that we will continue to work together to um, put smiles on, on people's faces and provide housing for um, the underserved population. Do you have anything to add, Bill? Um, no, I think maybe we could get into the questions if you'd like or yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill and Melissa. And if you could imagine a huge round of, of applause right now, um, you'd, you'd probably be all warm and fuzzy inside. So uh, we, we do. We really appreciate you guys here. And um, and it was really inspiring to kind of see what you're do, what you've been doing for so long and how you've um, always, you know, included the, you know, included the community uh, in the whole design process and, and been really inclusive. I, I think that shows up really clearly in all your projects. So, um, so thank you again, that was great. Um, I'd like to um, hand it off to, um, to uh, one of the, someone had a question, uh, Tan Lee, can you unmute and ask your question? If you're still there. Tan, you can unmute your line. Hi, sorry, I trying to figure out things. Um, so um, this program is really great. I mean, I I am very uh, impressed with the this this program, and I was wondering how can I join the group. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things. So we, you know, we are a nonprofit architecture firm, but we basically financially uh, function like most private firms. We are fee for service. So we get um, 
you know, we get standard architecture fees for our projects, and that's mostly what funds us as an office. Because we're all employees, there's no owner as a nonprofit. We can use uh, our resources in a little different way, and that allows us to kind of use the funds uh, in some interesting ways. We end up doing a lot of pro bono work. So many of our clients just don't have the initial funds to get their projects off the board. So we do a lot, uh, sometimes our initial feasibility work is done on a pro bono basis. And then once the, uh, you know, the organizations get their funding, then we engage in a full service contract like a standard architecture firm. So. All of us as employees are, you know, we're employees of a firm like anywhere else. Uh, we do have volunteer opportunities too. We have a board, a volunteer board, and we sometimes occasionally have, uh, you know, um, individual projects that will engage the architectural community to help out if there's a desire. We've uh, gotten involved in actually building some of the tiny houses. So we as a group have been volunteering with one of the groups is building tiny houses to put into those villages. So that's another way we volunteer and engage in our outside of just our work setting. That's awesome. Um, John Coppola. We, we also uh, have uh, oh, yeah, some opening career opportunities if you're interested in applying. Yeah, so you should check our website. We're uh, check when we're looking for uh, hiring. We actually just hired some emerging professionals, so I don't know where we are right now and our needs, but yeah. And Tom, just so you know, there um, if you're if if you're from Las Vegas, uh, there there are a handful of firms that do a lot of community-based work. So, uh, so if you want to stay here, uh, there's some great opportunities to do this stuff too. Sure. You don't have to move to Seattle to make a difference, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so uh, our next question, um, John Coppolis, um, I had a question about uh, how do you balance, you know, fair employee salaries against the desire to provide nonprofit services to your clients? You just mentioned, you know, your pro bono services and so forth. I mean, um, I, I imagine you pay, a, you know, um, a competitive wage, right? You're not just, you're not operating yeah, nonprofit I mean, and making everybody sort right. of live on, live on baloney, right? No, I mean, we... You know, we monitor the going rates in Seattle. We have to compete for people just like any other architecture firm. I think we tend to attract people who are here for the mission. Um, so, you know, we all have bills to pay. Seattle's a particularly expensive place to live, you know, so we all have high housing costs. So we I think in general, we try to be pretty competitive with the going salary rates, uh, but we do have a very committed staff here who um, who are here to, to serve the mission. You know, we have people who've stayed here a long time. I've been with the organization 25 years. Uh, we try to create an environment where people can grow and build and thrive. We don't have the opportunity for, you know, ownership, like in a private partnership, but we still seem to be able to provide a work environment where people can kind of grow and become the architects they want to be. That's great. I mean, it just seems like a, a really great, you know, um, laboratory for, yeah. um, you know, for, for young architects to learn how to become citizen architects and how to be how to be kind of community leaders and to be advocates and 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 really um you know uh, be in, be engaged at the community level instead of you know the occasional client meeting <laughs> you know yeah um, and then go back to your desk and and get get back to work you know yeah i think and personal firm you know, Melissa talked about this HDC organization we're a part of. One of the great things about that, they have great networking opportunities to engage with the affordable housing community. They have a leadership program that we've been active members in. So we, we try to bring our younger staff in and engage them with uh, other 
providers in the affordable housing community so they can get to know all the players and they become then, you know, their cohorts throughout their career. So yeah. what does uh, HDC stand for? The Housing Development Consortium of okay. King County. So it's all basically everyone who's involved in building, developing affordable housing, public agencies, architects, contractors, nonprofit developers, uh, bankers. Oh, it's, Got it. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I, uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, my colleague, Lance Kirk. He's also my friend. <laughs> mention that. Lance, are you unmuted? Or can we unmute Lance? Well, he, he should be able to mute your line. There you go. Oh. There we go. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yes, thank you, Melissa and Bill, for the presentation. Um, I noticed that in a lot of your projects, it appears you're um, driving down to almost zero for the energy costs for the users of the buildings and the residents. And so can you talk about uh, the importance of energy and, and kind of climate justice and equity um, since this affects typically low income communities and how that's important? Can you discuss that a little bit? Sure. And I get we do have the luxury here in the Northwest that you don't have. We don't typically in our housing provide air conditioning. So that's a huge, you know, obviously energy user that um, that we don't have to deal with here. We basically are just dealing with uh, heating. And um, many of these extremely low income projects, the owner is actually paying the utility costs. So it's really the more we can do to reduce their long-term um, maintenance costs, the more they can put into services. Because, uh, you know, especially on the permanent supportive housing projects, it's not just a home they're providing, they're providing the outreach services to kind of help people get their lives back together and hopefully move on to more, um, you know, permanent situations. So, uh, the more we can do in our designs to reduce building and operating costs, the more benefit it is to our owners and clients, obviously. And a new, one of the other new innovations that just has come about in Washington in terms of healthy indoor air is they now require uh, mechanical ventilation in all our apartments. So we don't just rely on, you know, opening the windows to get fresh air. Now all buildings are required to have uh, mechanical ventilation. So we've been introducing heat recovery ventilation into all our housing projects now. And that's had a huge impact on air quality. Uh, you know, especially now in the summer times when we have some poor air quality to during the wildfire season, people don't want to open their windows because it can be pretty nasty out. So the, uh, the HRV systems really help in that. You had another question, Lance? Sure. Thank you. Um, so how do you guys address when you're in your community <laughs> workshops? How do you address like conflicting ideas or solutions? Like when you have two opposing approaches, what, what kind of how do you guys work through those in community? Or, or those or those personalities, you know, yeah. that, that just won't, you know, aren't as aren't as collaborative as their neighbors, you know? Yeah. Well, we it's an interest, you know. Um, we have been trained, Melissa, actually, I should probably let you answer this. We've been trained in this uh, community engagement process called the pomegranate method, which really has developed to kind of address those issues about how to uh, hear everyone's voice. So we have a system where we go around the room, everyone gets a voice, we kind of uh, gather that information and then the top ideas kind of rise to the surface. And then we go through another round where we really kind of build consensus. So uh, it's a way to give everyone a voice, voice their opinions, but then the best ideas kind of rise to the surface. I don't know, Melissa, do you wanna? Is there anything to add? 
Yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. And with having a pointed question or um, during the whole design process, you don't kind of just say, hey, uh, design this for us or um, it's, a, it's a very pointed question of, of how, like what is important. Um, and so it's, it's more so if people express, you know, that safety is important or privacy or um, like more bigger ideas than um, implementing and being really stringent on, they want to have a, a pool or something. So uh, by, getting everybody's uh, opinion and, and voice by giving them a couple of seconds. Um, it's really easier. It's good to be able to moderate um, those people that seem to, to speak or have a, lot, a, a louder voice. And so this um, makes it to where every person gets to speak and um, gets their ideas heard and then as we um, gather that information, then certain common themes usually come up. And that's uh, usually how you can go back through the group and they can put a check on, on the ideas. So there isn't one um, person that, that speaks louder than everybody else. Well, thank you. If I could also add, you know, a lot of these projects are controversial. They aren't initially uh, community supported, can I, as I should say, so especially kind of the support of housing or housing for the homeless. So the community engagement process, what we found is really, it takes time, but we found over time the community, if you, they get listened to, if they feel like their voices are being heard, a project that could start off controversial becomes accepted and embraced in the community. Sometimes we have groups who fight these projects from the beginning and then at the end they're coming in and volunteering and you know teaching the kids to read or something. It's an amazing transformation we see that happens sometimes in a neighborhood over time with these projects and that's really one of the gratifying pieces of this work too is how Sometimes the neighbor, or many times, the neighborhood ends up embracing these uh, these projects into their community. Yeah, it turns into a yes in my backyard instead yes, of a no. Exactly. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Alexia, you have a question. Are you unmuted? Go for it. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process you go through to set the energy or environmental goals for your projects. Do you work with the, you know, as a part of the community process, you work with the owner? And also I was curious for the tiny house project that you presented first, um, how did you achieve lead? Because I know, I don't, I don't remember if you said how big those tiny houses were. So if you can talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you know, our energy goals are very, Many times they're driven by owner. You know, we have a lot of expertise, as we've told you about LEED and Net Zero. And many times it's the owner. We engage with owners who want to achieve higher than, you know, code standards. In the state of Washington, our, to get uh, funding, we have to meet a higher standard than our energy code. It's called the ESDS system. So every housing publicly funding housing project already has a higher bar than kind of uh, code standard, but then occasionally we have projects that really want to push push the envelope, like the Claire's Place project we showed you, and also the Place of Hidden Waters, and those, you know, um, those were driven many parts by the owner, and we actively engage with them and work with them to, you know, meet those goals. We engage with an energy consultant early on. We put together a team that's skilled uh, in high performance buildings and uh, kind of work in concert with them. Uh, part of the choices that are made are done during that workshop charrette process because uh, you know we do have limited budgets even on some of these high performance billing and trade-offs have to be made so 
There is an active engagement process that happens during that. And we use the energy modeling process a lot to kind of do those trade-offs, uh, evaluate the cost benefit analysis, the life cycle costs and determine which most bang for the buck kind of thing. Great, uh, Alexia, did you have any more questions? What? Thank you. Oh, the tiny house lead? Oh. Yeah, the tiny house did not meet any uh, lead thing. The, one of the interesting pieces of the tiny houses is they are designed uh, the hundred, they are eight by 12, it's the footprint. So they are below the threshold of requiring a building permit. And that was a concern, that was a choice that was made to make them easily built permit or not permitted and brought on site. So uh you know we did we you know those are kind of minimally insulated but they're so small basically they're heated with a light bulb if you will so yeah cool. yeah um So um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised, but if, you, if anybody does have a question, uh, please put it in the chat or do the little hand up thing. Um, but uh, I did have one, one quick question about the, um, the Everett Safe Streets Initiative. Um, that whole idea of, of re reallocating kind of, you know, wasted resources that go to, you know, um, incarceration and court costs and emergency room visits and, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, which is a, which is, I, I think I've read like sometimes twice as much as it would cost to just, you know, uh, pay someone to have a, a permanent house and basically eliminate all those problems, you know, where they, where they have outstanding, you know, um, citations that they can't pay, sure. and, you know, and, and things like that. Um, can you kind of, uh, talk a little bit about that and, and, and also let us know if, if, if you guys get involved in that, in that level of, of advocacy, you know? Yeah, I, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be in Seattle, which has really been at the forefront of this kind of housing first model. There's an organization called uh, DSC, the Downtown Emergency Service Center, and they, they basically did the first housing first building. It's now almost 20 years old. And yes, they did, they, and they do a lot of research and they were finding the costs in, you know, emergency room visits and car jail time was just, you know, costing the city a lot of money. And so the idea is you don't eat, you know, you build the housing, you get the people in the housing, you don't, and then you address the chemical dependency, substance abuse, mental health issues, because people can't really uh, address those things till they have uh, a safe home to live in. And uh, Seattle's really been at the forefront of that. We have a number of uh, nonprofit housing providers who really understand the housing first model, permanent supportive housing, and provide, you know, high quality services to their residents to kind of get their lives back together. And we've been fortunate to work with a number of those organizations. They, uh, it's amazing the work they're doing. Yeah, that's one of the real pleasures of this work is the groups we get to work with. No kidding, that's awesome. Well, I think that's it, James. If, if um, I'll just hand, hand it back to you. Does that sound good? Sure, sounds good. All right, thank Carlos, you again. If I can uh, get the screen. So I wanted to thank everyone. I wanted to especially thank Melissa Schock and Bill Singer for participating tonight. Um, it was a great presentation. It was a great discussion afterwards. Again, I'd like to thank Rick and all of the COAT committee. Um, please go and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, we've actually started to do some updates there, and so you'll see some new, new things and some changes that have come about. Uh, also on your screen, we have Carlos's email, so if anyone has any additional questions or if there's further interest in joining the COAT committee, um, go ahead and email Carlos and we'll get you in touch with Rick and the rest of the committee members. I want to thank everyone for their attendance tonight and look forward to seeing some of you in person next month at our 47th annual 
AIA Las Vegas Golf Tournament at the TPC Summerlin. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks again, Bill and Melissa. You guys are awesome. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Great to meet you guys.